Last week, we saw that Andean civilization took on unique qualities because of its unique combination of high mountains and profoundly dry deserts. This week, we'll continue to look at that ethnically fragmented landscape, beginning with the second period during which the whole region was culturally united, the Middle Horizon. The Middle Horizon begins about A.D. 600 and lasts up to A.D. 1000. It begins with the onset of another period of drought, punctuated by periodic El Nino-caused flooding. These tag-team environmental problems led to widespread political and cultural turmoil, and lots of population movement throughout Peru as people tried to escape disaster. One of the first signs that things were changing came with the decline and ultimate collapse of the Moche state on the north coast of Peru. As water became sparser, people gathered in the Moche cities where irrigation and wells meant water was still available. But when El Nino weather brought destructive floods, this meant that a larger portion of the population was affected. Recall that Moche were tightly integrated by a carefully controlled state-sponsored art program. It depicted Moche leaders as being supernatural entities engaged in a variety of mythical or legendary events. Presumably this meant that common Moche saw their leaders as being responsible for the supernatural maintenance of their world. But when disasters began piling up around A.D. 600, this became a major problem for the leaders. The people could see that they were no longer doing their jobs. This crisis of faith, so to speak, can be seen in a variety of ways in the 7th century. The most interesting is that imagery at the Huaca de la Luna in the Moche capital at Cerro Blanco was revised. A new mural on one of the ceremonial courts at the Huaca included a new deity, one facing forward, rather than in profile, as was more common in Moche art, and holding a tall staff in each hand. This is the staff god of the old Shavin cult, imported from the highlands in an apparent attempt to placate whatever forces of nature were sending the floods and drought. Interestingly, the mural was covered over again soon after. When the new god failed to solve the problems as well, he was abandoned. All turmoil in the Moche region ultimately led to the collapse of the state centered at Cerro Blanco. The massive Huaca del Sol, center of the state, was abandoned, as were almost all the residential sectors. Huaca de la Luna, a temple, may have continued to be used for a while, but it also was soon abandoned. Around the same time, north of Cerro Blanco, another Moche city rose to prominence. Scholars believe that the center of government shifted from Cerro Blanco to Pampa Grande, and along with the shift came a major reorganization of Moche society. Architecture at Pampa Grande was constructed with a much less labor-intensive method. Rather than being made of solid adobe bricks, its huacas were built by constructing walls around hollow spaces that were then filled with rubble and dirt. Labor was organized differently as well. While each adobe brick still carried a maker's mark, indicating it was the product of a specific social segment, the marks are now mixed in among one another. So while brick making was segmented by community or clan, construction was mixed. Leadership ideology also appears to have evolved in this period, as the imagery on Moche ceramics changes and we see new characters and themes. A newly popular theme is known as the burial theme, which shows two supernaturals burying a deceased king or deity. Another character is tortured nearby. Scholars interpret the tortured individual as a doctor or an advisor guilty of allowing the king to die. It's a powerful reminder that the Moche are thinking about failures and placing blame in the light of these disasters. Reorganization, new government, and new deities didn't save the Moche state. Pampa Grande itself was burned and abandoned sometime shortly after A.D. 700. Finally fed up with failed policies and leadership that was powerless to protect its citizens, the Moche people seemed to have decided to abandon the entire system. Many Moche cities had already been abandoned, and those that were left either vanished or shrank markedly. People dispersed to smaller settlements where life was still possible, and for a long time the north coast was quiet. Meanwhile, in the highlands, a new, far more widespread power was rising that would ultimately unite much of Peruvian civilization together, the Wari. Wari civilization, true to its unique Andean heritage, 
is not a familiar form of state, however. Michael Mosley in your textbook is at pains to explain that Andean highland states fell into two organizational categories, intensive and extensive. Intensive states are those familiar to the Western tradition, a single government highly centralized around a single capital that integrated the populace into one large political entity. Wari civilization fell into the second category, that of an extensive state. In an extensive state, government presence is limited to a few strategically located administrative centers who ensure that the central capital's interests are served. Outside of those centers, local government and even identity is left largely unchanged. Extensive states can therefore cover much larger territories with fewer administrative resources, but they have less integration and more instability. The Wari state was extensive and seems to have achieved its expansion by offering peoples on its fringes an interesting combination of agricultural technology and religious ideology. It thus grew by accretion and persuasion rather than conquest, and strongly centralized government was not necessary. These innovative agricultural technologies were obviously attractive to Andean farmers as the post-AD 600 drought set in. While agriculture was not impacted in the highlands as much as along the coast, yields still went down. Huari's promotion of terracing, short irrigation systems on the terraces, and new, more productive strains of maize were very attractive. Coupled with new religious ideas that seemed to support the new farming techniques, this led to a boom in crops at just the time the traditional farming practices were declining. Thus, if you lived in the Andes in the Middle Horizon and you wanted to eat, you'd better associate yourself with the Huari. The Huari state was centered at its capital of Huari in central Peru, just north of the modern city of Ayacucho. At its height around AD 1000, between 10,000 and 35,000 people lived there. The layout and organization of Huari reflects its economic foundations. Away from the city, Huari civilization spread through agricultural technology, but in the city itself, the focus was on other sorts of economic activity. Architecturally, most highland cities have to be partitioned and broken up into districts in order to fit on the steep slopes and hillsides of the mountains. Huari, though, is so heavily partitioned, with walls separating districts and traffic so tightly controlled by gates and entryways, that this must have been an intentional policy. Artifacts found in each of these separate districts suggest that they were occupationally specialized. Residents in each section of the city engaged in different jobs. Perhaps the official policy was one of finding your own unique contribution to the state as a whole. Away from the city, Huari civilization soon came to dominate most of northern and central uh, regions of the Andes. In the mountains, administrative centers ensured some level of direct Huari imperial control. On the other hand, along the coast of Peru, Huari control seems to have been more tenuous. Away from the mountain slopes where the innovative Huari farming techniques were most effective, its imperial influence seems to have been more ideological and religious than political. The Huari-inspired architecture in these regions was less secular and more religious in nature, and there never seems to have been as much integration into the state. The southernmost extension of the Huari influence actually impinges on the territory of the other great empire, the Middle Horizon, Tiwanaku. Remember that Huari organization relied on isolated pockets of Huari governmental and cultural influence, and outside of those immediate locales, things were left mostly to themselves. Tiwanaku, the great Andean Empire of the South, was a more tightly integrated, intensive state, but early on in the Middle Horizon, the Huari made a bold push into Tiwanaku's territory at Cerro Ball. Cerro Ball is a flat-topped mountain west of Tiwanaku, on the western edge of the Andes. It had been, for centuries, a sacred mountain to the southern Andean peoples, who lived and farmed in the valleys around it but ignored the slopes and flat top of the mountain because their agricultural techniques didn't work well there. The Huari, on the other hand, could make a living at those altitudes, and about A.D. 600 they established a town in the summit, essentially saying, look at how we can make a living where you Tiwanaku folks can't. Despite this rather provocative choice, the people at Cerro Ball seem to have lived mostly peacefully next to their neighbors for 300 years, 
until the town was abandoned at the same time as many nearby Tiwanaku towns. The ninth and 10th centuries were times of upheaval throughout the Tiwanaku realm of the southern Andes. During the early intermediate period, remember, Tiwanaku had expanded its influence throughout the region mostly through ideological means, especially by reviving the Shavin staff god as the gateway god that we discussed last week. After AD 600, though, its influence changed from ideological to more secular, and Tiwanaku began to assert its direct political influence throughout the southern Andes. We see this at sites like the Omo Complex, discussed in your textbook, which were newly constructed administrative centers that maintained seemingly tight control over the populace. Tiwanaku itself maintained its control of the region by exploiting the rich agricultural fields surrounding Lake Titicaca, further developing and ultimately perfecting the ridged field agriculture that produced twice the yield of flat field agriculture. Tiwanaku farmers were able to bring in two crops every year, meaning that the city was better fed and healthier than any rivals, cementing its dominance. Unfortunately, in the return of a common theme of Andean history, changing weather patterns ultimately spelled Tiwanaku's doom. In AD 1000, Another drought, this one lasting centuries, set in. The levels of Lake Titicaca dropped, making the ridged fields impossible to irrigate, and the city lost its advantage. Such a huge city was no longer feasible, and the city was destroyed violently soon thereafter, whether by enemies or by the Tiwanaku themselves is uncertain. Following the fall of Tiwanaku and the contemporary decline of Wari, we enter the late intermediate period from A.D. 1000 to 1476, the official beginning of the Inca Empire. This period begins with 400 years of protracted drought that caused a major reshuffling of Andean civilization. Big cities and huge empires could no longer be supported, and people dispersed through the mountains to smaller farming communities. Populations moved from the bone-dry coastal plains to the highlands where some water was still available, or they clustered along the actual sea coast to make a living off the ocean. In the south, the former Tiwanaku domain, there evolved a series of small kingdoms speaking the Aymara language, who would remain the dominant force until the Inca swept through in the 15th century. These kingdoms were what archaeologists refer to as peer polities, Independent states had interacted as equals, both cooperating and competing with one another. They shared language, culture, and a common response to drought. That is, they refocused on llama pastoralism in the landscape that would no longer grow crops reliably. Their rivalries with one another, however, meant that they could not present a united front against Inca expansion, and they were all eventually swallowed up by the empire. Further north, in the central Andes, we can begin to see the development of the culture that would eventually become the Inca. Official Inca histories recorded by their Spanish conquerors in the 16th century tell of an Inca culture that developed rapidly and burst to prominence only a couple generations before contact. Archaeologically speaking, this is not true. Two closely related traditions, both best known by their artistic styles, are seen as forerunners of the Inca culture. The Quilque style was centered in the central Andes just north of the vicinity of Cusco, the Inca's eventual capital, and the Lucre style was centered just to the south. Both traditions appear in the archaeological record at the beginning of the late intermediate period, and by about A.D. 1200 appear to have been allied with one another and centered at the capital Cusco. Inca cultural development in this phase seems not to have been particularly militaristic, as many settlements lack fortifications. By 1375 or so, the distinctively Inca style of artwork and material culture is evident, and not long after the empire began its rapid expansion. We'll discuss imperial Inca culture next week, of course. But before we do that, let's finish this week by looking at the Inca's major imperial rivals, Chimor, the second largest empire ever to arise in South America. While the Inca Empire was centered in the mountains and built on the arid montane economic model, Chimor was centered along the north coast, the old Moche region, and built on the maritime oasis model. 
Its capital was located at the huge metropolis of Chanchan, which began aggressively asserting its control over the north coast early in the late intermediate period. Chimor maintained its dominant power in the north until the Inca defeated them in 1470. Colonial histories tell us that the history of the Chimu people was actually associated with two different lines of kings. One was centered at Chanchan, and seems always to have been either a monarchy or a system of dual rule, with two kings at the same time. The other, called the Namelap Line, was located farther south and seems to have been a confederation of smaller city-states. Both king lists are probably highly mythologized, but they are also confirmed in broad outline by the archaeological record. The Namelap Confederation was made up of a series of a dozen or so small cities that maintained a coastal trading network that potentially reached to Mesoamerica. Its largest city, Batán Grande, was the center for the manufacture of axe money, metal items that look a bit like axe heads, which were traded as money along the South American coast. Examples have been found uh, along the Pacific coast of Mesoamerica. Around uh, A.D. 1100, however, as the drought worsened, Batán Grande was burnt and destroyed, and the region was later incorporated into the much more centralized Chimor state. Again, the traditional histories are not fully accurate, but broadly reliable. They recount two periods of expansion. The first is recognized archaeologically by the incorporation of the namelap cities, though in the traditional histories this process played out much more quickly. The second period of expansion happened more rapidly in the 14th and 15th centuries, as the Chimu and the Incas became rivals for control of the Andean region. In general, Chimu culture seems to have followed a strategy of making the best of a bad situation as the drought worsened and didn't let up. Drought always hit the coastal regions of South America much worse than the mountains, and Chimu peoples responded by shifting attention back to the ocean and maritime resources. This was a more reliable source of food, and the little water that remained could be drunk by the people themselves rather than being devoted to crops. What agriculture there was required extensive government-managed irrigation systems and deep wells. As water became scarcer, cities throughout Chimor, Chan Chan included, experienced dramatic population drops. People simply had to leave to find better homes. Chan Chan, when the Inca finally conquered it in 1470, had a population of 35,000 or so, very large by any standards, but still smaller than at its height a few generations before. The city was occupied by craftsmen, artisans, and bureaucrats. No farmers or herders lived in the city itself because their fields by that time were located too far away. It also seems to have been an official policy of the empire to keep those occupations at some distance from the seat of government. Chanchan itself is known for a dozen or so large palace complexes, known as ciudadelas in Spanish. Each ruling lord of Chimor seems to have built his own ciudadela and moved the seat of government there. Thereafter, the former palace remained as a mausoleum and temple to the past generation. These ciudadelas are also characterized by their audiencias, small, three-walled enclosures that appear to have been used similarly to offices. A person of prominence would sit facing outward and conduct business with those standing in the opening of the room. Different sizes of the audiencias and their different locations in the palace complex indicate the sorts of businesses that may have been conducted there. Often, there is one much larger audiencia with much more carefully controlled access that probably served as a throne room. Chimor thus reflects a different strategy than the Inca for responding to the protracted drought of the late intermediate period. As rainfall dropped and crops became less reliable, the Inca and their neighbors retreated higher into the mountains and intensified their farming techniques. The Chimu shifted their attention to maritime resources and refocused on making do with the water that they had available. Unfortunately for Chimor, as the drought finally ended in the 15th century and the Inca Empire began to expand, their arid montane strategy proved more effective. We'll see exactly how the Inca Empire became the largest empire in the history of the Western Hemisphere next week.